Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, Tyler has, uh, Tyler Grunendahl has asked me to uh, give a quick introduction to uh, Dr. Kersner, and uh, it, it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Kersner to you. If I were to do full justice to his accomplishments, I would be up here for the rest of the day, and I'm not going to do that. I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, Dr. Kersner completed his PhD in economics at NYU in uh, New York University in 1957, where he studied under the great Austrian school economist Ludwig von Mises. Uh, many of us believe that of all the great economists who learned the discipline from Mises, uh, Dr. Kersner is the most important. His scholarly work includes uh, uh, very important contributions in the history of economic thought. For example, his book, The Economic Point of View, uh, works in capital theory, an essay on capital, and especially his contributions in the theory of entrepreneurship and market process, which began with his book, uh, Competition and Entrepreneurship. I'll say that for me, the most important single event in my uh, development as an economist was the opportunity to study with Dr. Kersner when I was at NYU. And he served as my advisor, or as he had served as my dissertation advisor, and I also had the good fortune to uh, take his courses in Austrian economics and history of economic thought. Uh, those of you who have taken or are taking those courses with me here at Hillsdale may well know that uh, what I teach in the classroom is heavily influenced by what he did at NYU. But when I'm teaching, I'm always afraid that what I'm giving you is a watered-down version that doesn't do full justice to what he did. And so today, I'm extremely happy, extremely pleased, uh, to, that you will be able to learn directly from the master himself. So I'm going to present to you Dr. Israel Kershaw. Thank you, and thank you, Professor Steele. I must say that uh, when Professor Steele uh, did me the kindness yesterday of calling me to touch base yesterday, and he told me about the courses that he teaches and the, uh, the excellent students that he has, uh, I felt that probably whatever I'm going to tell you today, uh, you've all heard of before. Uh, so I apologize for that, uh, but we'll try anyway. <laughs> Uh, I noticed as I came in, I noticed that the title of my talk was listed as the history of the Austrian school. Uh, that's not quite accurate. Uh, the, I'm going to be talking about the history of the Austrian school uh, insofar as it relates to the theory of the market process, which means I'll be talking about the history of the Austrian school uh, in its second half. The, uh, the Austrian school began in 1871, it's usually the date given when Menger published his first, his, his main book, uh, and that was, that was 143 years ago. Um, a half of that time would, would, be around, uh, would be around the early 40s, and it's around that time that the, the midpoint of the history of the Austrian school, that the Austrian school, in my opinion, uh, did a drastic turn, a drastic deepening of its doctrines. And my focus will be mainly on the change from the first half of the Austrian school's history to the second half. So I hope you won't be mis uh, misled by the title, the, the ambitious title. I'm, I'm not going to try and give you a full history of the Austrian school. Uh, usually we identify the Austrian school with subjectivism. By subjectivism, we mean uh, that we're convinced that the regularities in economic life can be understood only by focusing analytical attention on individual actions, with full attention to what is perceived, what is expected, what is understood by the individuals involved. That's what subjectivism means. Then, if one it identifies us, the Austrian school with subjectivism, I think that's, that's correct, uh, then the second half of the history, the history since about 1942-43, uh, can be seen as a radical deepening of Austrian subjectivism. And I'll be focusing on that, on that uh, deepening uh, development. 
that took place in the decade around, around 1943. In particular, I'll be focusing on the decade between 1937 and 1948, about that decade. I think that was a crucial decade in the history of the Austrian school. I'll, be, I'll, I'll come out first with, with the claim that, that I often make. I make the claim that at that time, the historians of economic thought were declaring Austrian economics to be dead or dying. Hayek in London was considered to have been defeated by Keynes, by Frank Knight in Chicago, in, 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 different, in different aspects of his work. So Hayek was considered to, be, uh, to be, have been defeated. Uh, Mises was considered to have been defeated. And in fact, in the immediate post-World post War II era, it was generally understood in the economic profession is that, the, uh, that Austrian economics uh, had a distinguished history, but no future. And it's my contention that in this decade, precisely in the decade during which it was the, the, the last rites were being performed on the Austrian school, precisely in that decade, uh, the, uh, Mises and Hayek, the, the, great, the great proponents of Austrian economics, were deepening their subjectivism and drastically redirecting Austrian economics so that the subsequent history of the Austrian school can be traced back to the innovations that were taking place during this critical decade. Uh, this is the general, uh, the general uh, thesis that I will, be, I will try and develop uh, this afternoon. What was it that set off this change? After all, Mises had been working in economics for, for, for uh, four decades before 1943. Uh, Hayek had been working for several decades. What was it that, caught, that, that triggered this change, this deepening of subjectivism? I will maintain that, that what was responsible for this was the, was the debate uh, concerning uh, socialist economics, the possibility of socialist planning. During the 30s, uh, well, in, uh, really during the 20s in, in, on the continent, but during the 30s in, in, the, in the United Kingdom, uh, there was a vigorous debate concerning the possibility of socialist calculation, the possibility of central planning. Uh, Mises had claimed that central planning was a contradiction in terms. It was impossible. And there were all kinds of attempts to show that Mises didn't know what he was talking about, that Mises was wrong, that it was possible, it can be done, and this is how you do it. And it was their exposure, it was the exposure uh, which uh, Mises and Hayek were, had to these attempted uh, refutations of their claim, uh, because Hayek had in fully endorsed Mises' claim, it was, these ref it was their, their exposure to these refutations that forced Mises and Hayek into deepening the, 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 the level of subjectivism uh, with which Austrian economics deals. Let, let, me, quote, let me quote to you. The, the history is really, I find it fascinating. I began, I began studying economics seriously in, in 19, uh, 1950, 53. And in 1953, uh, the, the, the first seminar that I heard from Mises, uh, he, he made a statement that to me was, uh, was meaningless. He said, the market is a process. I didn't know what that meant. I, I, I'd studied a little bit of economics uh, before, and I, knew what the, I thought I knew what the market was, uh, but I never heard of it described as a process. Uh, and it became very clear to me that what Mises was teaching was totally different than what was being taught in other economics courses, that was being taught in the textbooks uh, that I had been exposed to. And this led to my, my focusing on a remarkable contrast between Mises in 1933 and Mises in 1953. In 1933, Mises had written the following. This, uh, you can find this in his uh, Epistemological Problems of Economics, which was the translation of his Grundprobleme der Nationalökonomie, published in 1933. 
there he writes the following passage. Within modern subjectivist economics, it has become customary to distinguish several schools. We usually speak of the Austrian and the Amer Anglo-American schools and the school of Lausanne. What he meant was the Austrian school, centered in Vienna, the, the Anglo-American school, mainly, mainly following Marshall, and the school of Lausanne, of course, following Walras. Now, Mises continues, Morgenstern's work, that's Oscar Morgenstern, the, the, the great uh, progenitor of game theory in economics, Morgenstern's work has said almost all that is necessary about the fact that these three schools of thought differ only in their mode of expressing the same fundamental idea and that they are divided more by their terminology and by peculiarities of presentation than by the substance of their teachings. That's the end of the quote. In other words, Mises was claiming that all the schools, all the modern schools, the subjectivist schools, he described all of them as subjectivist. All of these subjectivist schools were saying the same thing, except they said it in different ways, different languages, different, different tools, different, different diagrams, but, or, or, or words of versus diagrams, but they were saying the same thing. I can assure you that 20 years later, in 1953, that was not Mises' position. Mises' position is that, was that the Austrian school was the only school of subjectivist economics, and that they were totally, but what they were saying was totally different than what the other schools were saying. So this is this contrast between what Mises endorsed in 1933, he was endorsing the statement by Morgenstern, and on the, on the one hand, and what he, was, what he certainly believed in 1953 when I became to be exposed to, uh, to, to Mises' uh, economics in 1953, that contrast needs to be understood. What was it? So I claim that what, what led to his realization that the subjectivism of the earlier of these other schools, the Anglo-American <coughs> school, the Lausanne school, was totally superficial. It did not, it, it was, was not the subjectivism of the Austrians. And it was his work, and that of Hayek, in the, well, in the decade that I described between 1937 and 1948, that really, uh, that really presented the deepened subjectivism that constitutes modern Austrian economics. Modern Austrian economics meaning the economics of the second half of its history. And it's that school of Austrian economics that has had a remarkable resurgence in the past, in the past, uh, uh, past uh, three or four decades. The, um, the truth was, Mises didn't recognize this in 1933. The truth was that by 1933, the mainstream, the, the Anglo-American school, the Lausanne School, and eventually they, they merged together in, in, in to, make, to make up the mainstream of modern economics. I'm leaving Keynesian economics on the side, to the side for the time being. Uh, the, uh, the, this, this, the, the, what, was, what was happening, what was developing in the mainstream was an emphasis on market equilibrium as being the, the goal and the essence of economic understanding. I believe there were three contributing elements that uh, led to this, this position <coughs> of the mainstream. First of all, the gradual acceptance of the Walrasian perspective. Walras was, was a, presented a system of equations. What he was describing was that the, what he was claiming was that the market represents the solution to these simultaneous equations. Now, the solution to these simultaneous equations is a matter of equilibrium. And this was one of the elements that led to the emphasis on equilibrium in mainstream economics. A second element, I believe, was the introduction by Frank Knight of his sophisticated concept of perfect competition. If you, if you read the elementary textbooks of today, there's a chapter on competition, and when you read that chapter, you begin to wonder what on earth, what, what language is being taught, is being spoken here. Uh, the, the, you were taught by your parents, there's a competitive world out there, you better try harder, because you've got to compete with so many other students, you've got to compete with so many other athletes, you've got to compete with so, so, many, so many other 
uh, prospective employees. You've got to compete. You've got to do something different, better. You've got to work harder. You've got to try harder. And, of course, uh, perfect competition, nobody tries harder. Everybody is doing exactly the same. That's what competition means. Perfect com if, it's, if it's not that, it's, it's imperfect. And then it's not perfect competition. Real competition, the perfect competition, is where everybody doesn't have to, everybody is doing exactly the same thing. Now, Knight articulated the conditions that have to be satisfied in order to, to, uh, uh, to, to create the, the, the state of perfect competition. The, the conditions that he articulated was, was a sophisticated set of conditions, including perfect knowledge, including have, having represent, rep, representations concerning number, concerning size, is the perfect knowledge uh, element that's the most crucial uh, from our point of view. And uh, the, the truth is that perfect competition has no meaning outside, outside equilibrium. So when somebody tells you, I'm going to draw a, a supply and demand curve on the board, we have to understand that we are, we are in a world of perfect competition. I'm going to draw the supply and demand curve for that, for that world. You know, what, you, know, you know what the diagram should be? If I'm going to draw a supply and demand curve for a world in perfect competition, you know what I should do? I should put a point. That's it. That's the whole diagram. What about, what about, what about these lines? Well, the only point that's consistent with the conditions of perfect equilibrium with well, a perfect competition is this point. Is this point? If you, for example, if the price is above equilibrium and there is a surplus supply, what does that mean? That means the conditions have been violated. Well, nobody would waste their time selling at a high price if they know they can't sell it. Perfect, with perfect knowledge, nobody's going to speak. But this position is impossible. This point is a point oh, which is valid only if there was a hypothetical demand curve going through. Okay, so that at any given point, in, at any given situ situation, the only point consistent with perfect competition is that. Which means that you've given up all the possibility of explaining how you get there. Because you started out there. So, I, I'm, 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 forgive me, I, 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 I get lost when I think about perfect competition. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to get at here is that, that it's the, it was the articulation of the <coughs> conditions of perfect competition which had a great deal to do with the, fo with the exclusive focus by economists in the 30s on the, on the equilibrium position. Don't misunderstand me, Frank Knight was a great economist. Really, he really was. He was one of the most brilliant and profound economists. But his notion of perfect competition, I think, contributed to, uh, to the unfortunate uh, exclusive focus on equilibrium uh, which came to dominate mainstream economics. And finally, it was the Marshallian supply and demand curve analysis. Right? It was, it was this. Everybody knows that the price is right there. Everybody knows that that's going to be the price. Because everything else is unthinkable. The price is there, then there'll be, to be, there'll be surplus to surplus supply. It's going to, going to go down. If, the, if that's the price is over there, if there's going to be a surplus demand, the price is going to shoot up. So the only, the, everybody knows that it's the intersection that's going to be the price. So that leads to the idea that it's the intersection of those curves, which, which in, in effect, of course, means the solution to a, to a set of simultaneous equations, okay, which came to, uh, which came to be the center point of, of modern economics. And as I've claimed, it was the, it was the, the experience of the socialist calculation debate that I believe led Hayek and Mises to realize the mistake that Mises had made in 1933 in judging, in understanding uh, the, uh, the, um, the other schools of, of so-called subjectivist economics. See, the reason why he called them subjectivist economics is because there was a demand curve in the picture. See, the old classical economists wouldn't even have a demand curve in the picture at all. Everything depended on brute nature brute physical nature. Uh, for, 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 for Ricardo, uh, what determined uh, the course of economic events was the, was the 
physical nature. Uh, physical nature being confronted by, by insatiable demand of, of human beings as consumers would lead to a certain, to a certain pr proportion of land being, uh, being cultivated and everything else uh, would, would uh, be derived from that basic fact. And, and the demand had no f independent role. It was the marginalist revolution of the 1870s that, that led to the introduction into economics of a healthy respect for the demand side of the market. And Mises was, was overjoyed at that development. That's why he called them the subjectivist schools. And they were subjectivists in that sense, but they were not subjectivists in the sense uh, of Austrian economists, Austrian economics, and it was gradually during the 30s that uh, Mises came to understand that. I believe it was the, it was the uh, experience of the Sotus calculation debate. From, from about the end of World War II and until, until the 1970s, for about, about uh, 30, 30 years or so, it was generally understood that Mises had raised an important question in 1922 when he, when he claimed that uh, central planning was impossible. He raised an important question because, and Mises pointed out, uh, factors of production. The, uh, the resources used did not have, it was impossible to have prices in, under socialism because under socialism all resources are controlled by the state. Therefore, there is no market price for resources. If there are no market price for resources, there is no way in which planners can, can efficiently allocate those resources because they don't know how, how important they are. They have no prices attached to them. That was, that was basically Mises' argument. And uh, the literature said, well, that's a, that's a good point. That's a good point. And they began to show how, nonetheless, it's possible to have, uh, to have a socialist planning uh, authority that would be able to, to uh, emulate the, the allocated efficiency of a market. I won't go into the details of, of that, that debate. It was, the, it was in, the, in, in the 80s that Austrian, Austri young Austrian students began to realize how wrong the mainstream was in this respect and how, profound, and how profoundly right Mises was. One of, the, one of our, our really most gifted students at NYU, uh, uh, Don Lavoie, he, he became a professor at George Mason, unfortunately he died young, uh, but he wrote his dissertation on this, exactly this point, on the, on the point of the misunderstanding by the mainstream of, of the Mises Hayek position on, on central planning. And what, that, what his dissertation consisted of was the demonstration that if you understand the role of the market process, if you understand that role, you'll realize that it is, it is impossible for a central planning authority, no matter how honest they are, no matter how sincere they are, no matter how public spirited they are, they are it's impossible for them to know what the, what the most efficient way of allocating resources uh, could, could possibly be. So this was a beginning, a beginning f focus on the market process, which I mentioned earlier was the term that I recall when I first came to Mises Seminar back in 1953, the market process. So I'd like to, to, to uh, draw attention to what we mean by the market process. What Mises and Hayek were doing in, their, in, the, in this remarkable decade, in 1948 to, 19, uh, to 1937 to 1948, uh, that decade included Mises's National Economy, which later became Human Action. Okay, it was, it was published in 1940 uh, in the German language, published in Geneva. Okay, in 1940, it was it became, it, the English version was in 1948. So this was Mises' contribution, and in that book, which is the, one of the most uh, disastrously neglected volumes of the history of economics, in that book, 
uh, Mises did articulate what he meant by subjectivism, what he meant by the market process. He did articulate that. Uh, that was his contribution. Hayek, on the other hand, during the same period, was writing a series of remarkable papers uh, having to do with knowledge, the role of knowledge in, uh, in, the, in the market system, in the market process. And uh, these, he published those papers in, uh, in his, in his uh, extraordinary little book of 1949, Individualism and Economic Order. Those, in that book, you'll find the series of papers, uh, four or five papers, uh, in which Hayek talked about uh, socialist calculation debate, he talked about competition, he talked about knowledge, uh, knowledge in economics, and uh, th those, contr those contributions gave his side of the deepening of subjectivism. I'm not claiming by any means that what Hayek was writing in this decade was identical with what Mises was writing in this decade, not at all. There are fundamental differences between Hayek and Mises, but that's not our focus today. Our focus is, is, is on, the, on their shared understanding of the economic process. That was shared. Uh, Mises focused not on knowledge, he focused, as we should see, on the decision, on human action. Uh, Hayek focused on knowledge, and we'll develop that a little bit more thoroughly as we go, as we go on. But it was, it was their understanding, but as, a, as a result of being, of being exposed to all these criticisms, and there were very fierce criticisms, bitter criticisms, that Mises and Hayek were suffering uh, by the end of the 30s. They were being, they were being almost denounced uh, for, for criticizing socialism. You, you have to remember the, the, the spirit of the times was that socialism was the wave of the future. And uh, the, the work that Mises and Hayek was doing, were doing in challenging the possibility of central, central planning, uh, was, conceived, was really sort of as treason to the development of, 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 of social well-being. And the, the, it, was their, it was their gradual uh, be, be, be discovery of what it was that was driving, what it was that intel, was intellectually driving these criticisms, uh, which was their, as I've argued before, it was their, uh, their statement, the, the, the critics were, were understanding the role of the market not as a process, but as an articulation of equilibrium conditions. It was their discovery, it was Mises and Hayek's discovery of this commonality among all the, uh, the critics of, of the socialist calculation, of the Austrian socialist calculation position. It was their discovery of this uh, which led them to understand what was necessary, what deepening of subjectivism was necessary in order to meet these criticisms. We've drawn attention to the, to the excessive emphasis on equilibrium. This reached a point where when economists began to talk about so-called welfare economics, what they were talking about was the degree of well-being that a society would have under equilibrium, and in the state of equilibrium. That's what welfare economics meant. And efficiency meant achieving that pattern of allocation which could be shown to be optimal in, in, the, in a com perfectly competitive state of affairs. That was how they saw, that was how they read welfare economics and that was how they read the normative side of economic analysis. And, and the side of economic analysis which focuses not only on what is and what happens but on how good it is. What, what the, how good what happens is, or, or how, how not good it is. So, so that the criticism of, of uh, the Mises higher positions on socialism had a great deal to do with the excessive emphasis on 
equilibrium. If you simply take this, 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 this aspect. Now, of course, the the the, the, the analysts of the 1930s were not talking about Marshall. They were talking about Warrasian equilibrium. So I'm going to put it in terms of of Marshallian equilibrium. If you if you think of these, if you think of this situation, and you focus on this position, so focus on this equilibrium position, then you you are implicitly assuming perfect knowledge. You're implicitly assuming perfect knowledge, without without really articulating it. Knight, I did articulate. Knight talked about perfect competition as being perfect knowledge, but the standard the standard theory. Simply said, well, uh, you know, if the price is, is too high, there'll be excess uh, supply, the price will be forced down. That assumes that there's instantaneous discovery, instantaneous knowledge of where price is too high. If price is too low, there'll be instantaneous discovery of where price is too low and instantaneous correction. Because that's what you mean when you say this is going to, the, the, this situation will be in effect the we will generate the equilibrium price you are in effect claiming that the equilibrium process will be so unerring so absolutely apodictic to use Misesian terms that uh, that it can happen right away it is it, anything else is almost impossible impossible Now there were two ways. There were, there were two ways. I want to focus on the two ways in which Hayek, two separate ways in which Hayek and Mises, and Mises uh, disengaged from this position, which they were able to challenge this position. Hayek was led to point out the role of knowledge and knowledge discovery. He pointed out that the competitive process. He used the word competitive process. The competitive process is a process of knowledge discovery. So competition is not a state of affairs in which everybody knows everything. The competitive process is a process by which people come to know what it is they didn't know. More accurately, they come to know what it is they didn't know that they didn't know. And there's a big difference. If you know what you don't know, then you, then you can presumably you know how to find it. If you don't know somebody's telephone number, and you have a telephone book, then you know how to find it out, find it out, because you know what it is you need to know. But if you don't know that, you don't know it. If you don't realize that, that, that somebody else is selling at a lower price than you, if you don't realize that somebody is, is, is bidding a higher price than you're bidding, then you, then you have no reason to look for anything. The market process, the competitive process, according to Hayek, is a process of knowledge <coughs> discovery. The word discovery is crucial. It's not search. Later economists, particularly Stiegler, George Stiegler, great Chicago economist, they focused on search. But search is not discovery. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not denigrating the economics of search, the economic analysis of search, but it has nothing to do with the market process. The, the, economics, the economics of search is the economics of a particular kind of production. If you want to produce cars, there's a way of producing cars. If you want to produce knowledge, there's a way of producing knowledge. But, so if you're searching for knowledge, that's a way of producing knowledge. But you know what you're searching for. You know what you're looking for. You know that there's something to be looked for. Just like you know that there's a car that needs to be produced. So you know what you have to produce. You, you, you allocate your resources in order to produce what you, wanted to, what you wanted to produce. So if you know what it is you don't know, you just don't know it. But you know what it is you don't know. You know how important it is that you would know it, and you know exactly how to find it out, and you can produce it. Like you can produce cars, like you can produce pencils, like, like, like you can produce uh, soft drinks. But that's not what discovery is. That's not what Hayek was talking about when he talked about the competitive knowledge discovery procedure. He was talking about that there is a process by which people begin to realize what it is they haven't known before, what it is they haven't been aware that they haven't known. And this is what they can lead them to discover. The, perfect, the, 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 the competitive process 
the process of competition is a process of moving from ignorance to awareness. Not, not, the, not a matter of producing knowledge. The mistakes that are being made, because one doesn't know what one doesn't know, are gradually eliminated by the competitive process. What is required for this process? Not infinite number of buyers and sellers like it is for night. Not an infinitesimal size of each firm like it is for night. What is necessary is merely freedom of entry. If people are free to enter, they are free to discover, to notice what is available to be noticed. The, the world operates by people noticing things that they haven't noticed before. The market process is a process by which people notice what they haven't noticed before. That is the, 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 the Hayekian uh, process of, of, uh, of learning, the discovery process of the market. That was Hayek's side of the, uh, of, of the development, of what I call the deepening of Austrian subjectivism. Mises, on the other hand, focused his clarifying explanation of the market process by replacing the decision which had been developed by Lionel Robbins. Lionel Robbins, who became Lord Robbins. Lionel Robbins, in 1932, had defined economizing. What does economic mean? Well, Robbins said, I'll tell you what economizing means. Economizing means allocation, efficient allocation of resources. Somebody has scarce means, he has, uh, he has uh, goals that exceed his, the ability of his means to, to satisfy them. So he's got to allocate. He's got to make sure that no resource is used to produce something which is less important than something else that could have, it could have produced. So you've got to have allocation. That's, that's, that's the essence of economics. And decision making, which is the essence of the economic process, is the, is the economizing decision, the allocated decision, the economizing decision. That's, what, that's how Mises, uh, that's how Robbins defined the decision. Mises rebelled against that. Mises argued that the decision is human action. You know, the title of Mises' book, 1949, is a remarkable title, Human Action. The German title I, meant, I mentioned earlier was National Economy. National Economy is a prosaic textbook title. National Economy. Human Action is, is a sort of creative, imaginative, uh, title. Uh, it's a subtitle that has to do with this treatise on, 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 on economics. But, but by giving it that title, <coughs> Mises was focusing our attention on his claim that Robbins, Robbins was a, was a great economist, don't misunderstand me. Robbins was a, was, was a great admirer of Mises and of Hayek, by the way. He brought, he brought Hayek to London in the early 30s. Uh, but, but Mises claimed that Robbins was constricting the decision into an inappropriate box. An inappropriate box. Let me illustrate. Supposing there's a room which says decision-making room. On the door it says a sign, decision-making room. And somebody's, somebody comes and knocks on the door, I'd like to make a decision. Can I come in? I'd like to make a decision. And the fellow opens the door, will tell him, listen, you know, you don't really have to come in. Tell me your objective function. Tell me what it is you want to do. Give me your list of constraints. Go out, go out, and, go out and have a cup of coffee, and we'll tell you what you've decided. <laughs> because why? Because what is decision making? Decision making in the Rabinzian sense is a, is a mathematical exercise. You've got given means. You've got goals which exceed the ability of the means to satisfy them all. So you've got to allocate. Well, that's a mathematical problem. How do you, what pattern of resource use can you devise that will maximize the utility or profit or whatever the, the, you're trying to, whatever the maximum end is? So that's mathematical. That's decision making. That's decision making? Can you imagine somebody's got to decide whether to get married or not? Knocking on the door and they, and they tell them, give us your objective function 
and your and your resource uh, list of resources and go back and have a cup of coffee will tell you whether you decided to get married or not. <laughs> That's decision making. What about the agony of decision making? There's no agony in mathematics. Is that true? There's no, there's no, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing agonizing about, about, about doing the mathematical exercise, right? You, 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 you make the calculation. It may be difficult, but it's, but it's not agonizing. What is agonizing about deciding to get married or deciding which, which, which graduate school to go to? What is agonizing about deciding uh, what, what, to, what, what, what flavor ice cream to, to have? What's so agonizing about it? The answer is because you're not sure. You're not sure. In other words, what's agonizing about decision making is precisely left out in the Rabindian system, namely the lack of knowledge. <coughs> the, the fact that you don't know exactly what it is you're going to get, you don't know what the future is. If you're deciding whether to go to law school or medical school, you're deciding about your future. You're deciding about, about whether, whether you're going to appreciate uh, the, 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 the hours of training and, and practice of, and, uh, to do with medicine. Uh, versus the hours and training that you're going to have to go through in the, in the practice of law. You don't know. You've got to make a decision. That's, the, that's where the agony comes in. So Mises drew attention when he called the human action, when he called economics the science of human action. What he meant was that economics is a science of real decision-making, real, this true decision-making. And true decision-making is always entrepreneurial. Mises, it was Mises who made this profound statement that every human agent is an entrepreneur. Because what is an entrepreneur? <coughs> an entrepreneur is somebody who has to make a decision in, in, the, in the teeth of an, un, of an unspecified future. That's what an entrepreneur is. He's got to guess as to what the future is going to be. He's got to guess what the, markets is, what the market is going to be for his product next year or, or, or 20 years down the pipe. He's got to guess that. He's got to, he's got to look into the future. That's, that's entrepreneurial. That's every human action, every human decision. Your decision to come here today was based on, on an entrepreneurial uh, estimate on your part as to whether you're going to fall asleep here or not. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> okay, that was, that was your entrepreneurial decision. Every human action is entrepreneurial. That's what Mises taught us. Uh, that's why it's the science of human action. Economics is the sign of human action. The market process is a process of entrepreneurial discovery. It's a process of entrepreneurial discovery. That's why the two sides, the Hayek side focusing on knowledge discovery, and the Hayek and the Misesian side focusing on entrepreneurship, they, they fit so well, so neatly. Each one was, was taking his own position. They, they, were not, they were not in full communication. They were not in full communication. The Mises was developing his, in, in his uh, where he was in Geneva, Hayek was, was in London. They, they, were not, they, they were not sharing. They were not sharing. They, they, these were independent. But they both represented the healthy Austrian understanding of the market process. I claim this is a radical deepening of Austrian subjectivism. What Hayek was doing in these years what Mises was doing in these years was a deepening of our understanding of that which had been taught before. The reason why in 1933 Mises had thought that the, Aust that the other schools were pretty much the same as the, as the Austrians was because there had been a shared, <coughs> loose, loose understanding of the market process. It hadn't been defined as carefully as Hayek and Mises were to define it in this, cru this crucial, critical decade. It was because of that that, that that Mises thought, well, everybody really, really, really understands, understands the nature of the market process. Everybody really realizes that, uh, th that the advantages of a market process, the advantages of a market system, the advantages of a free market, which means freedom of entry, that's, that's crucial, it's been crucially uh, understanding. Let's understand the critical element of freedom of entry. Freedom of entry means if I think of a good idea, if I think of an entrepreneurial way of discovering profit, I should be free to, to, to do it. The fact that somebody else is going to be hurt by my, my entry, <coughs> by my brash entry, I'm going to produce a new type of bicycle that's going to make his bicycle obsolete, 
I'm going to, I'm going to produce a, a car that's going to make his horse and buggy obsolete. That doesn't matter. So if freedom of entry means you're free to try whatever you think can be profitable. That's what's cor that is what corrects the waste of the horse and buggy and the waste of the old, the old style bicycle. It's waste because there is a better way of doing it. Better from whose point of view? From the consumer's point of view. From the consumer's point of view. The market is subject to the will of the consumer. The producers, the entrepreneur, is subject to the will of the consumer. This is what Mises meant when he talked about consumer sovereignty. Consumer sovereignty means that it's the entrepreneur who has to guess what the consumers will want. Uh, five years down the pike, ten years down the pike, five days down the pike. The, 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 uh, the entrepreneur has to guess what that, what, that, what that future demand will be, and that's how the, uh, the entrepreneur should be free should be free to try and do his best. Do entrepreneurs make mistakes? Yes, they do. Can they make mistakes? They certainly can. Do they make mistakes? They certainly do. But it's the only the ability to make mistakes, the freedom to make mistakes, that can stimulate the, uh, the discovery procedure which leads to the correction of the mistakes that have already been made. When, when an entrepreneur makes pure profit, when an entrepreneur makes pure profit, what he has done is he's made a discovery. There's a, there's a line in Mises, which is almost a stray line, which I often quote. He said if, if an entrepreneur is making a profit, pure profit, I'm not talking about so-called normal profit, which the textbook talk about, there's no such thing as normal profit. But if somebody makes pure profit, what he's done is, he has realized, or he has been accidentally fortunate, but he has realized that the true value of the resources that he bought for, for 10 are really worth 20. Those resources, he paid 10 for them, and he's turned them into a product that sells for 20. He made, he made 20, $10 of pure profit. He's the one who realized there was a gap in the value, the highest value that other, other producers were attaching to these resources and the value which the consumer attaches to these resources. The consumer attaches a higher value than the producers, all the other producers have realized. He has discovered an error, right? The, per the entrepreneur who wins this profit, he has discovered an error. What is that error? The people haven't realized that the true value of the resources was higher than they thought it was. Consequently, this, this entrepreneur who was correct in this discovery, he made a profit. That's a, that's a, the, a line in, in one of Mises' uh, sort of incidental papers, which is so profound, it opens up our understanding of what Mises meant when he said the market is a process. The market is a process, yes, of knowledge discovery. It's the process of entrepreneurial discovery. Mises once sent me to read a paper by Hayek. The paper is entitled The Meaning of Competition. It's, a, it's one of those papers that I referred to earlier that, uh, um, that Hayek wrote and published in his uh, Individualism and Economic Order, The Meaning of Competition. I, and Mises sent me to read that paper. And in that paper, Hayek makes the point, which I mentioned earlier, that competition is a process of discovery. Competition is not a state of affairs, it is a process. To, to us Austrians, it seems almost obvious. But I can assure you that when Hayek first articulated that, it was a discovery. It was an innovation. It, the textbooks hadn't realized that. The textbooks had not realized that competition is a process. They had not realized that the market is a process. When, when <coughs> the, the, uh, again, I'll go back to Marshallian diagrams, simple Marshallian diagrams. You can, you can extrapolate this to more complicated Walrasian situations. But if there's a shift in demand, <coughs> if there's a shift in demand from D1 to D2, and then we postulate there's going to be an increase in price, increase in demand, an increase in price. 
Makes sense, doesn't it? There's a sudden influx of demand, it, makes it, it drives an increase in price. Well, exactly how does it happen? How does it happen? Why, why should the price go up? Well, the whole the equilibrium price was down here, the new equilibrium price is up there, this is higher than this, the price obviously has gone up. Okay. <laughs> Well, how does that, how does it work? Well, you'll say, because, because when there's been a sudden increase in demand, the quantity that would, would now be demanded at the old price is greater than the quantity that would be supplied. There's an excess demand that drives the price up. Why exactly, pray tell me, will the price go up? Because, because sell, buyers will realize they've got to compete. Buyers will realize they've got to compete. It means that they realize they've got to do differently than we've been doing before. The sellers will realize that they can get away with charging a higher price, and there's no reason why they shouldn't do it. So the price will rise until, until the, 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 the crux of equality. Don't misunderstand me. I've been, I've been knocking as my shell into anchors over the past hour or so, uh, but, but I don't want you to, to misunderstand me. These are very valuable diagrams. These are very valuable diagrams. If, if you had to teach uh, some, some economic students uh, three weeks of economics, Make sure this is included. Make sure that's included. But if you're going beyond those three weeks, uh, make sure you understand the limitations of this, of this, of this kind of diagram. So let me come, let me come back to, to the history of Austrian economics. As I've indicated, I have not given you a history of Austrian, of, of Austrian economics. I've given you, I think, a history of the drastic change that took place in the middle decade of the entire history of Austrian economics. That drastic change was a categorical deepening of the subjectivism which had been the, the watermark of Austrian economics ever since Menger, Karl Menger in, in, 18, in 1871. The uh, the deepening consisted of understanding the nature of the market as a market process, a process of discovery, a process of decision-making, not a rabbinic decision-making, a process of entrepreneurial decision-making. These were the two sides, the knowledge aspect, which, is, which Hayek emphasized, that's a deepening of subjectivism because, you because subjectivism requires you to pay attention to what people know, what they think they know, what they expect, and so on. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the emphasis on entrepreneurship uh, represents the, the Misesian emphasis on seeing what's around the corner. We always have to see around the corner, and we always do because we turn the corner. How dare you turn a corner? Who, how do you know there may, it may not, be a, may not be a car on the sidewalk that's, that's, that's driving towards you? How can you turn the corner? You've got to make entrepreneurial decisions as to what's around the corner. And all our lives, we are making entrepreneurial decisions. As, as Mises emphasized, human action is, every human action is an exercise in entrepreneurship, which means an exercise in acting in an open-ended world in which we know we don't everything, we don't know everything, and which we know that we, are, we should be open to discovery. And that is what the market process is. The market process, as Hayek and Mises taught us, and it is this, in, this insight which I believe has nourished the resurgence of Austrian economics over the past half century. And uh, I have every confidence that uh, as uh, as academicians have uh, opened their minds and begun to understand the profoundness of uh, the, the, the Mises Hayek insights into the market process, I have every confidence that this resurgence will continue and this will be to the benefit of mankind. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we've got 10 minutes for questions, and if we don't get to your question, we will have an afterglow at AJ's immediately if you want to come to that. So, feel free. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, 
I have a question, and I'm not sure. Um, well, I have a lot of questions. Um, you, you're being I, very entrepreneurial. <laughs> yeah, I think one question that I think might be most um, salient to sort of the context of Oakdale is, as I understand it, um, Leo Strauss, and I, I disagree with Strauss's reading here, but I wonder what your thoughts on this is. Leo Strauss has a challenge to meet this on the concept of, or to Weber, I think it is, on the uh, concept of value, freedom, and the social sciences. Can you comment on sort of what a uh, necessity and response to that would be? Okay, my, my knowledge of Straussian theory is very limited, is very limited. Uh, what I once knew I've forgotten. Um, when you reach my age, that's one of, the, uh, one of the luxuries you have, you can forget things and people understand yet that you forget. But, my, but I, can, I can tell you something about value, value freedom. Value freedom is something that, that Austrian economists have emphasized. Mises believed, Mises certainly believed, and, and there's a paradox here. Mises was often accused of not being value free. He was accused of injecting his ideology into his economics. Mises, on the other hand, was a champion of value freedom, Wert Freiheit. He was absolutely convinced that it was necessary for economists to detach themselves from their own personal judgments of value in order to articulate objective science. It goes back a long way. It goes back to the Austrian, to the Mengerian uh, disagreement with the German historical school. The German historical school had no qualms about introducing their value judgments into their classrooms. No qualms whatsoever. And the, the, the Austrians, uh, the Menger at that time, and, as well as others, uh, Max Weber and so on, and that later, uh, they firmly believed that science has to be detached from values. And I, I must confess, I think Mises was not careful enough in, in insulating his science from his values. I, I believe that's, that's correct. If you read the last passage of Human Action, where Mises waxes passionate over how important economics is for the survival of mankind, now, what's important about the survival of mankind? <laughs> wow. Survival of mankind. Now, m for science purposes, it's irrelevant. Either economics, if, 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 if a certain type of, type of economic policy will lead to the survival of mankind, well, that's an interesting observation. It's an interesting piece of analysis. But objectively, you shouldn't, you shouldn't let your, your, your passionate interest in the survival of mankind uh, disturb you or, or affect, affect your judgment. Now, Mises was, was absolutely clear. He was concerned with the survival of mankind. And that's why he believed that economics has to be value-free. In order that nobody should say, you're, you're letting your, your values determine what your science is going to be. But as I say, I don't think Mises was careful enough. He wasn't careful enough. And therefore, with some justification, people began to get the impression that Mises, was, that Mises economics was simply uh, his, uh, his dressing up his ideology into, in scientific uh, garb. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Kerber, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I just to it's give, a good question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, of antitrust laws have been just a tremendous issue. Where do you stand on that, and how do you respond to all these criticisms of oligopolies and monopolies and stuff like that? So, as, as I've indicated, from an Austrian perspective, the only thing important about competition is freedom of entry. Whether there's one firm, or ten firms, or three firms, so long as every firm in the industry knows that other firms can enter, that's competitive. They're subject to competition. And uh, history has shown that. Uh, Mises himself used to cite the railroads. Oh, that sounds antediluvian. But the, ra the railroads, he's, and he was thinking back in the 1890s, who could compete with the railroads? And of course, he says, nowadays we have airlines. Okay? Well, uh, th that, that's exactly the point. If the competition is, does not require the Knightian uh, infinite numbers of uh, participants. It simply requires freedom of entry. Freedom of entry means that entrepreneurs should be allowed to try something new. They may, be, they may have a good idea, they may not have a good idea. Maybe electric cars are a good idea, maybe they're not a good idea. 
but the market will, did, will, will show whether these are good ideas. And unless you have freedom of entry, right, you're not going to have the, this experimentation, you're not going to have the entrepreneurial uh, guessing which, which, which drives the system. So uh, from this perspective, uh, uh, antitrust laws are profoundly anti-competitive. Uh, I was wondering about the freedom of entry part of the question. Uh, I have discussed with many people in the Chicago School, um, and they seem to believe in the same kind of ideas that I have, but at the same time, I feel like their ideas are weakened in the sense that they have a vulnerability to them that they don't really uh, admit to sometimes. So I, I feel like there are some things that I potentially help them. But I was wondering how, how do you think the Chicago School weakens itself in this discussion of mathematical economics? Okay, the Chicago, the Chicago School, their position goes back to Henry Simon. Henry Simons was a, was a strong proponent of antitrust laws. He was a strong proponent for free markets. But he believed, as, as other Chicago economists believe, that the market works only when it's competitive. Now, they realize we're in the real world. You can't expect real Nightingale and perfect competition, but you've you got to get as, cl as close to it as possible. So if you have oligopoly, well, you should do something about it, something can, you, can, you can act on. So that's the general attitude of that school of thought uh, that is, is a good example of the equilibrium position that we, that we could be criticizing this afternoon. And uh, I would agree with you that that's one of the most important uh, differences between an Austrian free market approach and a Chicago free market, the University of Chicago free market approach. I think that's correct. Yes, sir. Um, I'm in Dr. Steele's um, uh, History of Economic Thought class, and last semester we talked about Cantillon. And I was wondering if you could talk a little about Richard Cantillon's idea of rivals competition and how that influenced your work a little bit in Mises and Hayek, too. Okay. I, I, unfortunately, I can't give you an answer to that because of, because, because of my ignorance. Uh, Cantillon was a, certainly a pioneer in entrepreneurship. He, he is, is, is often cited as being one of the pioneers in entrepreneurship. Uh, what, a, what a role his, his work played in the development of these ideas uh, I have my doubts. Uh, I think it was a rediscovery rather than a direct influence. But I'm, I'm talking out of ignorance. I'm sure Dr. Steele has told you much more than I, than I can tell you today. Yes? Uh, I have a question about how, what exactly which aspect of action for Mises is entrepreneurial because he divides it into three steps, kind of, which is the felt uneasiness and then the vision of a better state of the world, and then the uh, belief in some kind of causal connection between your action and achieving that better state. So where does entrepreneurial uncertainty come in? Is it in coming up with some new vision of the world towards which you move? Or does the uncertainty come from the causal connection between your actions? I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not all that uh, an expert on the minutiae of the, those first chapters in human action. My understanding is that those, that classification that you've referred to was not a way of articulating the entrepreneurial element in human action, but it was the way of articulating what human action consists in. It does consist of these things, felt uneasiness, an awareness of a possible improvement and understanding of the causal connections. The entrepreneurial element is, is that each of these elements <coughs> is consciously present in an open-ended world. That's the entrepreneurial angle. I don't think it's any one of these. All of these are, are, are present in an op only in an open-ended context. In other words, the human being who, is, who recognizes felt uneasiness, uh, okay, he's uneasy now, will he be uneasy tomorrow? Okay. Uh, well, uh, the, 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 this is the causal connection today. Is that going to be the causal connection tomorrow? Okay, so in each of these elements, there's, a, uh, there's an entrepreneurial angle. And uh, I, I don't think that, that, that you, you should, one should look in the nitty-gritty of, these, of, these, uh, of this classification system that Mies has mentioned. I don't think one should look there for the meaning of entrepreneurship. I was wondering about your, uh, what your opinion is on Gordon Tullock's critique of the Austrian business cycle theory. Okay, uh, I'm, 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 not the, I'm not the person to defend the Austrian business cycle theory because I don't believe the Austrian business cycle theory is quintessentially Austrian in the sense that we've talked about Austrianism today. Okay. 
uh, which is not to say that it's not an Austrian theory. It, it, it certainly is an Austrian theory. It was first developed by Mises in a few, in a few couple of pages in uh, his 1912 book, The Theory of Money and Credit, what came to be he translated The Theory of Money and Credit. Uh, he developed this insight that uh, if, if the market in which interest rates are determined is rigged, okay, if the market rate of interest is rigged, then this will result in systematic, uh, in systematic uh, awkwardness, sy systematic uh, di disequilibrium in the intertemporal market, and that will that could lead to the phenomenon of the business cycle. Whether that is the historic reason for business cycles, he didn't really claim that. He claimed that th this phenomenon of uh, of non-free market rates of interest uh, could could be responsible for the for the for the uh, for the business cycle that came to be developed much more thoroughly and and, uh, uh, and in a more sophisticated way by Hayek uh, in, in the subsequent two two or three decades uh, and uh, it's fine but, but but I don't believe that that it's it gets that to what we've defined as the major elements of Austrian economics. That's we have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, in human action, it seems that Mises kind of lays out this case for epistemic foundations, and we start with one axiom and can, through logical deduction, um, kind of reach new truths about the world, about the market system, about things like that. And kind of after the middle of the 1900s, you know, around 1940, 1950s, with Klein and Wittgenstein and Sellers, no one really buys that anymore. How important do you think that foundationalism, I guess, has been and should be in the future for Austrian economics? Okay. Um, I, I've often uh, apologized for that first part of Mises. I, I've often apologized because I think Mises makes it seem as if everything in the rest of the book depends on, on that first part. I don't believe it does. Um, when I used to teach price theory, uh, which I taught from, with, 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 uh, from an Austrian perspective, of course, I used to, I used to, somewhere early in the semester, I used to say, the fundamental uh, presumption is that people have purposes. People are purposeful. Now, it's very difficult to prove that people are purposeful. Very difficult to prove. Philosophically, it's difficult to prove that when you see somebody running to catch a bus, that he's running to catch a bus. Maybe he's just running for exercise. Ah, oh, you know he's running to catch. You see the bus coming, and he's running. But, 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 but it's very difficult to prove. It's very difficult to prove. And, and, and as you say, the philosophers of science of the 20th century have made it even more difficult to prove. My, what I used to tell my classes was this. If you stand on a subway station in, in Lower Manhattan, and somebody comes over to you with his face distorted with rage, well, how do you know it's rage? His face is distorted. You know it's rage. And he comes at you with his fist raised, with his fist raised. What do you do? Do you calmly stand there and, and, and make a scientific observation and wonder what's going to happen next? <laughs> or do you get out of his way? <laughs> if you get out of his way, you have demonstrated that you are convinced that he has a purpose. And you, and you don't want to, you, you want to frustrate that purpose. Okay? He, wants to, he wants to hit you in the face and you, want, and you don't want to be hit in the face. And that's what I need. I believe that most people do believe in human purposefulness, and I don't believe that, that, that Austrian economics needs much more than that basic shared conviction that people do have purposes. What those purposes are in a particular situation may be debated, okay? Not, not necessarily clear, uh, but I don't think that the... You see, M Mises was a great thinker. He had an overall system. His system was, was overarching. He, he, his economics was embedded in a philosophical, a larger philosophical system. I don't buy that you have, to, you have to accept that larger philosophical system in order to appreciate economics. That's my own position. Not necessarily that of Austrian economics generally. Okay? That's my position. Is it, is it a waste of time to study uh, the first part of Mises? No, it's not a waste of time. But I don't believe one should allow one's conviction of the truth and, and, and the importance of Mises' economics to depend on, on one's appreciation of the first part of, of, of Mises' book. That's, that's my own personal position.
Okay, that's all the time we have for questions, but again, there will be an afterglow. So thank you once again.